Welcome to LA Interview. My name is Joseph R. Millis. This week's guest is Barry Carl, an American musician, singer, and voiceover artist who is best known as the basis for the a cappella band Rockapella. The group was the house band for PBS's children's show, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, which ran from 1991 to 1996. The group also had a very successful recording and performing career beyond their five years at PBS. Barry is best known for his deep signature voice, which he used to great effect with the band. He is also a very successful voiceover actor with hundreds of television and radio commercials to his credit. A classically trained singer and multi-instrumentalist, Barry's list of accomplishments are far too numerous to mention here. That's Barry Carl next on LA Interview. <laughs> Well, some folks say man's made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bone. Out of my last week and the back that strong. Sixteen cents. What you got? Come on, they hold on. Deeper on death. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. How am I so living in this You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're that banana with the greasy black eel. Greasy black Welcome to LA Interview, Barry. Thanks. Thanks. Um, while I was preparing for your interview, uh, I found myself spending quite a bit of time reading through your very extensive list of accomplishments on Wikipedia. Well, you know, it's wiki. Wiki. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe everything on wiki. Well, I, you know, uh, it's pretty intense. Um, you started out as an instrumental musician. I did. Moved on to opera. It's true. Did uh, voiceover work, and uh, around the same time you joined rock cappella. Uh, yeah. On screen acting. And if that wasn't enough, uh, you're a certified uh, Core energetics, core practitioner energetics practitioner and exceptional marriage mentor. Mentor. Right. What's next for you, Barry? Politics? Space travel? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think this is the next, really. I mean, I, the, the point I'm at in my life is that this is, this is it's give back time. Okay. Now. I understand uh, that. You know, I, I, I had a, a great time, you know, in front of audiences and traveling and getting all the kind of stuff that I, I wanted in, in those years in my life. It was, it was really important to me to have, uh, to get some recognition. Sure. Uh, you know, they say you can't give something up until you've had it. Right, right. And, and I had to kind of get my, my measure of that. Um, you uh, certainly did, very successfully. Thanks. And I got off the road in 2002 because my, my kids were growing up and I wanted to spend time with them and spend time in the house I was paying for, but not, not living really in. <laughs> and uh, I, I spent a few years kind of thrashing around, trying to find the you know find the new new contours of my life mm -hmm. because leaving the group was like quitting cold turkey. You yeah. know, like I didn't have a fan club anymore. <laughs> so I, there was there was kind of a, a I had to wean myself off of the carrot wax. <laughs> so, you know, and, and kind of bring myself down to size. Right. Um, and I, I've always considered myself a healer. I've been doing some kind of healing work for most of my life. I conceive of all of my performing experience, especially singing, as healing work. So this is, now what I'm doing is just engaged in it more directly. Sure. And I think the trajectory of the rest of my life is just going deeper with this work. I see. And, I see. and giving back to people because I've really gotten so much. Oh, wonderful. Uh, from, from the beginning of your childhood, what, uh, what led you to, to music? How, how did that journey begin? Well, I was born into a musical family. Right. Uh, I don't believe in accidents. You know, my dad was a, a, a jazz player. Right. He wasn't an improviser, he was a big band player. and He, okay. he was a doubler. He played uh, three different saxes and wow. flute and bass clarinet and clarinet. One of those guys. He was, yeah, he was. <laughs> and he played beautifully. Right. Just, he was an incredible player. Yeah. And my mother played the piano. Right. 
So I grew up around music. Where there was always music uh, playing on 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 the uh, on the Victrola. You know, <laughs> when, when I was a little kid, we're dating and, ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And and I, I I would identify records by by the colors of the covers. So I had favorites that I you know I'd go into my parents and I say you know put this on I'll you know I'll just listen until you wake up and. I, I started playing sax when I was eight because I wanted to be like my dad. Right. But I was always drawn to the sound of the French horn. And hmm, my first experience of perfect pitch was with the French horn, wow. which messed me up for the rest of my life because <laughs> it's a transposing instrument. Right. You know? I said, that was a C. No, it's a C on a French horn, which is an F on a piano. On a piano. So, <laughs> but my, my first grammar school teacher, um, I told her I wanted to play the French horn, and there was not a single French horn in the L.A. school, elementary school system. Really? And she went to the Board of Education and requisitioned one. It was the only French horn in the entire elementary school That's system. That's amazing. As my parents said, if you get an instrument, we'll get you lessons. And wow. It, it was another miracle. Oh. That's incredible. Yeah, a wonderful woman, woman named Ellen Saunders. That was your first teacher. That was my first grammar school music teacher. Right. She got me a French horn. Wow. And um, you then, uh, so many things. Take your time. You became principal horn with the American Youth Symphony. Yeah, under under Zubin Mehta's dad. Right. Mini. Uh, Mini. And then you would you uh, played extra horn on the L.A. Phil. L.A. Phil, Cleveland Orchestra. Cleveland Orchestra, American Ballet Theater? Yeah. Wow, and how old were you then? I was in my teens. My teens, that's yeah. remarkable. And uh, you also spent three summers uh, at the Music Academy of the West in, in Santa, Barbara. Santa Barbara. Yeah, that wow. was great, with Maurice Abravanel. What a wonderful conductor, and, wow. and what a wonderful man he was. Right, that's, that's great. And then um, you... Um, in high school, you got a scholarship for? For Juilliard. Juilliard. Yeah. That was a great story. You know, I never applied. Are you serious? School. Yeah. That's amazing. They used to have scouts, just like, that how you, like baseball that how you teams. Gonna, yeah. Well, they don't have the system anymore because they used to have a traveling jury, too. Three people that went around to major cities and heard people that were recommended by the scouts. And that year, it was the last year they had a traveling jury. I was 16. I was a, a, a junior in, in high school. I had won a scholarship that was offered by the L.A. Horn Club. Uh -huh. And one of the judges was the principal French hornist in the L.A. Philharmonic. Oh. And the scout called him and said, we're looking for horn players. You know, <laughs> do you know anybody? Yeah. And he talked me way up. Right. And so I got a call from the scout and said, We'd like you to come audition for Juilliard, and if you're as good as this guy says you are, we'll you're give in. you a scholarship, and we'll hold a place for you until you get out of high school. Oh, so then was the, two years later, you, you, that's yeah. when you went to New York? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in New York, you played with? Well, the, the Juilliard, Juilliard Orchestra. Orchestra. You know, the, uh, uh, the just, I, I was a, a freelancer, you know. I, you were? I, uh, yeah. I played in some of the studios. I, my first gig out of school was playing in uh, in a pit band for uh, a little night music. Oh. Uh, the guys were doing me a favor because they'd give me all their their holidays. Like I would I would play Easter and Christmas and okay. you know the, right, right. the shows when they, nobody felt like working. Like what great experience? I mean, it was, know. and I met I met a lot of great people, sure. and that landed me a job in the New Jersey Symphony for a few years. Right, you did three seasons. I did. Yeah. It was three or four. I can't even three remember four, now, yeah. but but that really firmly convinced me that I was doing the wrong thing. You doing the wrong thing? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd always thought you know the symphony a symphony gig was really kind of the uh, epitome that that's that's where that's what everybody aspired to. Right. You know, uh -huh. playing in an orchestra. Yeah. And uh, it turned out not to be what I really needed. You know, it, it was, uh, they were not a happy bunch of people. Um, <laughs> they were not a particularly liberal bunch of people. Yeah. And for most of them, it was a job. And, and not a particularly happy one. Right. It, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't the creative uh, apotheosis were, that's that's what you I, were looking that I was for. looking for. So then, uh, you transitioned from instrumental musician to operatic singing. To singing, yeah. And that, of course, led you to uh, a cappella. 
Eventually, yeah. I spent three seasons at City Opera. I, I, um, I did two uh, apprenticeships as, as a singer. Uh, the second one was in Central City, Central City Opera in Colorado. In Colorado, right. When I had to leave that early to go to City Opera. Right. Uh, and I spent four seasons there and I made a solo debut and did little teeny roles. And they didn't want to give me anything more than that, so I left City Opera and did regional theater and regional opera and started doing voiceovers about the same time, same time. in 84. 84, right. And uh, I went into Rockapella in 88. 88. In fact, they, I auditioned for them. They said, hey, great, you're in, we want you. Right. Then I didn't hear from them for That's four right. months. That's right, I heard then they, that. then they sent me this whole pack of music that I, they, they wanted me to learn. It was all like barbershop quartets and do up and, and, yeah, but bit Christmas songs and you know and all the stuff that was their bread and butter at the time. Right. And I looked through it and I put it back in the envelope and I sent it back to him. I said, I don't want to do this. Don't want to do this. And one of the guys called me up and begged me and whined and pleaded and said, it's not a big time commitment. <laughs> yeah. So I said, fourteen yeah. years so, later. And then fourteen years later. <laughs> yeah, working yeah. with them. So um, in two thousand two, you. I quit. You quit. Rockapella. Yeah. After 14 successful years, you guys did a lot of touring and oh, yeah. a lot Albums, of recordings and concerts, went all over the world, concerts, TV shows. TV shows. Yeah, that was fun. Right. And then you got more into the uh, voiceover work, I suppose, at that point. But yeah. I, that, I, I kind of expected that to take up the slack. Right. And, and it did really pretty well until the economy collapsed. Kind of tanked. Eight. Yeah. But you also um, did some acting on the yeah. screen. Yeah. You did a thing with Will Ferrell, a scene with Will Ferrell. Yeah, just just a few years ago. Just a few years and, ago. The other guys. Yeah, the other guys. That's a great movie. And yeah, that was fun. You were in a. You also sang. You were part of an ensemble group for the Corpse Bride. Yeah, those were all soundtracks. And nine. Nine. nine yeah, two. I did. Uh, I, I've done a lot of soundtracks. It's soundtracks. a lot of fun. In fact, I did. I did one the morning that my youngest daughter was born. Was the the Hudsucker Proxy. Oh, right, right. And probably the most fun one was uh, Joe's apartment. Right. I was a singing cockroach. Singing bass cockroach. <laughs> singing bass cockroach. All the uh, production numbers. Aside from all your wonderful artistic talents, uh, you're now working as a counselor. That's right. I understand that both you and your wife have your individual practices, and you both do team counseling for couples. That's right. Couples helping couples. Couples helping couples. That's great. And also, you teach the EMM method, the mm -hmm. Exceptional Marriage Mentor method, in Manhattan and Mexico. Yes. Tell me, tell me about that. Uh, well, th this model was developed by uh, two LCSW therapists, uh, and this this whole community is kind of based on the core energetics model. In, in some ways, you could call it core energetics for couples, but. Okay. The, the dynamic of couples working with couples, I think, is really, really um, effective because usually when there's one therapist, somebody it's gonna is, feel is, is, is kind of the, the odd one the out, out underrepresented. Right. It's a male or a female. Because, you know, my, Liz and I, my wife and I, ended up on couples therapists' couches ourselves any number of times. And if it was a man, then Liz kind of felt defensive and left out. If it was a woman, I usually felt marginalized. Right. And this way, both people get represented. And there's also something in the synergy of working as a couple. There are things that I'll pick up that Liz might not, and vice versa. Vice versa, sure. sure. So there's, yeah. you know, working with couples is a circus anyway. <laughs> and I, you know, I mean that in the very best sense. There's right. a lot going on. A lot on. going on. You know, Lots there's, of different there's, levels. Yeah. yeah, there's more than two people sitting in front of you. Right. You know, there's two people and their individual histories and their families and their parents and all their traumas and everything else. And, and then there's the entity of, of how the two of them mesh together. Mesh together, right. That's a third. It really yeah. is a third entity. Yeah, and so there's a lot to keep track of. Wow. So. And, and one of the main reasons I got into it was because it enabled me to work with Liz. Right. You know, we've been together for for 28 years, and there's there's always that specter of impermanence around relationship sure. and how much time do you have together, 
and we love being together and we love working together. That's wonderful. That's and a good that's a good thing. Yeah. So this is a chance for us to spend more of our time together and it's a creative outlet as well. Back to the artistic side. What uh, what kind of projects are you working on now and where do you see yourself in the next few years? Well, now that I'm finishing up my schooling, I can get back to working on a, a book of short stories that I started about five years ago. Are these adult or children's stories? Or well, or a combination? They're, they're my stories. Okay. Um, I think they're really more for adults. They're not targeted at children. Yeah, I read a few of them on your website. They're, oh. they're very funny. You have a very uh, interesting... Some interview. of them are funny, some of them aren't. No, right. You know, yeah. but, but you're uh, a good writer. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And, and my, my writing energy has gone into... That's you know, school papers and stuff like that. But, <laughs> but now I can now I can have a little more fun. Right. Uh, and Liz and I, ha ha we are currently working on the first edition of uh, a handbook to go along with the classes that we we teach the, the okay. pre-marriage couples. So that's taken a lot of yeah, no, other juice books, too. The books take a long time. But my, my, my future, hopefully, is just going to be more of the same. You know, m musically, I can pick and choose my, my gigs now because I'm not you so, know, focused on that. so focused on that. And I've always looked at that as healing work anyway. as well. You know, it's a vibra singing is a vibrational Vibrations. science. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I like to give my energy to projects that benefit a lot of people. So this holiday season, I did mostly benefit concerts. Wonderful. Did one for a hospice organization, one for an arts organization, um, and I like to sing for friends. Yeah, that's always, that's always you know, yeah. Th that's, so that's my that's my sharing. I don't have, uh, I don't. I'm not going to go back on the road. No, I don't see that. But uh, I remember reading something about you and some of the fellows from uh, Rockapella got my, together. My ex buddies, your yeah. ex buddies, and but you ended up doing some. Some work or concert? Or yeah, we've done some concerts. In fact, we did one last week at the uh, Turning Point, a club in Piermont, New York, a fairly okay. well-known club. And we did something we'd never done before. Which is? We played instruments. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> we sang and played instruments. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I play bass, yeah. electric bass. Right. Uh, Elliot Kerman plays piano. Sean Altman plays guitar. Yeah. And we, we Three did, great singers. And we did, we did a whole set with instruments, and then we brought up a a young rising star tenor who, who lives in Rockland, a kid named Josh Page. He's already been on stage with Josh Groban. And oh, wow. He is a killer, killer operatic singer. tenor, operatic but he can sing anything. And, 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 pop, and we did, you know, just a, a short set of, you know, chestnuts. And uh, it was great. We had a wonderful time. A lot time. of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. And we all have our own lives now. We're all busy. Right. Um, so we get together every once in a while. and. It's so easy because we put in so, so much many, time. So much time. Oh my God! You know. Yeah, it's like getting back on a bicycle. Yeah. Yeah. But more fun. More fun. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, it's really been wonderful uh, Thanks, talking Joseph. to you, and we look forward to having you on the show sometime soon. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Jericho, 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 yeah, just met the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. You can talk about your king of Gideon, you can talk about your old man Saul, but there ain't nothing like Joshua at the battle of Jericho. That morning, just met the battle of Jericho, 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 yeah, just met the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Up unto those mighty walls, he marched with spear in hand, said, blow them rambles, Joshua crying, cause the battle is in my hand.
You can learn more about Barry Carl's many other accomplishments by visiting his website at barrycarl.com. He is also listed on imdb.com and on wikipedia.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on LA Interview. Thank you.